Make some noise. Adidi, Adidi. Ladies and gentlemen, I I wish I would say it ends there. No, 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 no. I've got more people there. Um, and it's gonna be real. I'll teach you close because I feel like it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> the next story, Chella, you're gonna help me welcome this lady. I met this lady. Uh, when I first met this lady, I was like, wow, what a loud mouth. <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> yeah? But she's such a wonderful person. I've never seen such optimism. And I asked her, how do I introduce you? She says, I just want to be known as a student of life. Someone who's always yearning, someone who's, who's trying to understand how life is. But she is a person that you get a sense that she's here for us. Right? She's not sent here by the politicians. She's here for us. <laughs> With the greatest Hadithi Joe, please help me welcome Zoya Mabuto. Hadithi Hadithi! Hadithi Hadithi! Shining Sasha Kalu, put your hands together. During the pizza. I'm learning this vulnerability thing. I'm learning to lean into silences. I'm learning to let my tears flow. May I ask your permission to do the same for me? Resist the urge to rescue me? Resist the urge to hand me a tissue. Just trust that I will recover. Dingum tana om nane. On a man draman nane. And the silent bulela. Goku nangona pagate. Amen. My grandmother taught us this prayer as children. I remember we used to go under the table. We had a big dining room table. It was brown and like an oval shape. And every evening we'd go under the dining room table. We were very small, eh? not what now. <laughs> so every evening we'd go under the dining room table. We were about four or five. And she'd recite this prayer that eventually became sort of lodged somewhere in my subconscious. And so I got to the point where as this kind of five, six-year-old, I knew every evening we'd gather together, we'd say the Lord's Prayer in Mkosa, Uma to us as And then we'd follow it with this prayer. And what this means is, I am a little child. On a manja manjanane with little strength, mandisale ndibulela, let me always pray or give thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. And it was interesting because I grew up in a home where my grandfather was an Anglican archdeacon. He wasn't just a priest, guys. <laughs> he was an Anglican archdeacon, and so this made my grandmother the archdeacon's wife. I grew up in a home where my mother, for the most part, wasn't around because she was so heavily involved in the political struggle. And so when I think back to growing up in that home, I remember two things distinctly. The first was that every now and then, we would hear, do, 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 do. the security police would come, Looking for the likes of my mother, Steve Chwete, Nosfwema Pisa Nagula, Reverend Ustof, Prastof, Makengis Istofi. And what they used to do is sometimes they would go into the house, hide in the house, or if they weren't in the house, they'd go into the church vestry, and they would hide in the church vestry. 
And so it was a regular feature to have police come into our home, bash the doors down, and try to find my mother, as well as all the other anti-apartheid activists. When this house wasn't being bashed, on its doors by policemen. It was my grandfather bashing my grandmother down. Now this is interesting because I told you that my grandfather was an Anglican archdeacon. But he used to bash my he used to bash my granny. And as a young child, when you see all of this happening around you, you develop a narrative of sorts for yourself. And my narrative became this home the world is not a safe place. And so in order to survive in this world, I have to be strong. And that kind of became my storyline. The storyline that I developed for myself as a child. That the world is not a safe place. And in order for me to survive, I have to be strong. Fast forward a couple of years. And I remember experiencing my first ever disappointment. I think I was about 12, 13 years old. And this is not going where you think it's going. <laughs> I was about 12, 13 years old and I was going to my first school disco. Now school discos were like the shiznit, like they were the thing. You needed to get an outfit for the school disco. And so my parents went shopping and, I, and, and they purchased this beautiful sort of um, outfit for my disco. I remember distinctly because this was my first disco. I went to a girls' school, just to give you context. So disco meant that we were now actually going to meet up with the boys from the boys' school. And so disco was that time where, yeah, for, for, for the longest time, in fact, in the disco setup, the girls would sit one side, the boys would sit one side, and then eventually we'd find our way to each other. So I was looking forward to this. I'd heard stories about it from the guys who were in grade 7 or standard 5 at the time and I couldn't wait for my first school disco. We went shopping and we bought the cutest little like shorty thing that was like a skirt in front and shorts at the back. Do you remember how popular those were? So you had the sort of shorts at the back, it came up nicely, you zipped it up and then it was like a pretty skirt in front. So I bought one of those and I wore it with like a, and this, and this was also in fashion, with like a lin, a, a, not, not a, with, with a, with a lime green top. So at some point when I was about 12 or 13, what was also fashionable was wearing those bright colors. At some point I remember I had orange shoes and a lime green top. <laughs> Anyways, so I bought the stuff for the disco, I was excited, but I, I didn't have shoes for the disco, or at least the shoes I, I wanted to have. And so I asked a friend of mine, oh, tools, tools, you have these nice shoes that I think would look so great with my outfit. Please, can I just like borrow your shoes for the disco? Naturally, my parents were like, Zoya, you don't borrow clothes from other children. So this was a no-no, and I didn't tell my parents. Tools said, no stress, my friend. We already look nice at the disco. And so Tools promised that she was going to allow me to wear her shoes for the evening of the disco. On the evening of the disco, I rocked up in my beautiful little sort of short skirt and my lime top and I was wearing slip slops because Tools had promised that she was going to bring me shoes to wear with my outfit. And so I arrive at the disco, we're all excited and Tools arrives and she looks gorgeous as well. And I look at Tools expecting that Tools is going to give me the shoes and Tools casually looks at me and says, Oh Chomi sorry, I forgot your shoes. Oh. Oh. So what happens in that moment is, well, I do my first disco in my cute little short skirt and my line top and my slip slops. <laughs> and I remember Utu was kind of moving on with life, but I remember feeling incredibly disappointed. I know I was disappointed because I remember the story to this day. <laughs> right? But I remember I was like, I was quite upset and quite disappointed. But remember, I was also that little girl who said, the world, isn't safe, the world isn't a safe place, and so I can't show up as I am. I've always got to show up strong. And so I looked at Tools and I said, you know what, my friend, it's okay. It's fine. And I swallowed all of that pain of wearing slip slops to my first disco. I remember going back home and sharing this with my mom, 
And I think as I looked at her in my relaying the story to her, I realized that this was a big thing because she just seemed so sad listening to what had happened. Fast forward a couple of years later, I had my first experience of death. I was about 16 or 17 years old, 16 turning 17 in grade 11, standard 9. And I was, uh, by all means, like an, like an overachiever, guys, like, like a super chicken. <laughs> like, not everything. Like, I'm toned down, deliberately. Okay, okay. So, so, so let me paint a picture, let me paint a picture, right? Um, I, I sat on a church parish council from age 16, and the average age was 65. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, that was one of the things. I, I was in the first netball team. Um, I, I was quite, you know, good academic. Um, I, I, was, I was in the provincial team for debating, etc., etc. right? So I was, doing, I was doing incredibly well, but I was also doing a lot of things for a 17-year-old. And so I'm 17, I'm in grade 11, or I'm about to turn 17, and I'm in grade 11. And I've gone off to the Provincial Debating Championships here in Johannesburg. It was actually my first time in Joburg. This was the year 2000. So I find myself in Johannesburg, and then I go back from Johannesburg, and I return to East London, which is where I'm from. And uh, we're dropped off at the school, and I remember Mrs. McCann, an Indian family friend, coming to pick me up at the school. Mrs. McCann picks me up, and I think to myself, this is strange, why is Mrs. McCann picking me up? But of course, it's okay, I get into the car and off we go home. We arrive home and the mood is a little bit somber, and I wonder what's happened. And so I come into the home, and already by then I sense that there has to be some kind of death. You know that death quiet, or that, or that death thing? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know when there's death, you, you actually almost sense it before they tell you that someone has died. There's just a sensing in kind of somewhere inside of you, anyway. So I sense that something has happened, but I can't imagine to whom, because no one said anything to me. I arrive home and I discover that my little brother has passed on. He was a little baby, so he passed on in about, about four months. He was a four-month-old baby. He contracted some stomach virus something and he passed on. That isn't the sad part of the story, because death, death happened. I remember on the day of his funeral, the little coffin, it was white, and little came in. <laughs> and what we do in our family is people have an opportunity to go and look at, at the body. And they did that with the baby. And when it was my turn, I looked at the baby, and I didn't recognize him. And I looked at my mom, and I said, are you sure this is Uzeland? And she said, yes, this is your brother. And I just kind of remember in that moment thinking, how is it possible that I'm so busy? That I'm so busy doing all these things that I can't even recognize my little brother. But I tried to be strong for my mom. And so I don't remember crying for the death of little Zenande. I picked myself up and life continued. A few years later, in the year 2005. My mother is in hospital. It's February. My little sister and I are with her in hospital because she'd been ill. And on that day, my mother looks up at myself and my sister and she says to us, you are Nisebashi, which means you girls are so beautiful. After that, my little sister goes off to the movies and I stay with my mom. And my mom says to me, when you get home today, she says, go to my cupboard and you'll find what you need for everything that needs to happen. My mom passes on, and I'm sitting at home, and the time is about five past four o'clock in the afternoon. I receive a call from my uncle, who's drunk, and he says to me, Hello, Zoya. I'm just calling to confirm the rumor that Zo is late. My mother's name was Zo. 
I remember responding to Malume. Malume, I can't confirm that rumor for you, but I shall be sure to get back to you as far as I know. I mean, I've not heard. And of course, that's kind of how I find out that this, you know, my mom has passed on. But remember, for a little girl who says the world is not safe, you've always got to be strong. <laughs> I take it in, and life continues. Surely, soon as, or at least based on what my mom had said, we do go back to her cupboard, and I find this beautiful, beautiful, and I still have it to this day, but a beautiful, um, like letter that she'd written to myself and to my sister, Tips for Life. It's the most profound thing somebody has written to her daughters. Wow. Shade. It's beautiful. <laughs> anyway, so that happens. In this story, the interesting part is, because this little girl is so used to being strong, I immediately kick into what needs to happen mode. I find a friend, a young guy friend, his name is Tina, and Tina and I get into the car and we drive to the hospital. At this stage, she'd been so sick that she'd been moved out of private hospital and was now at Frey Public Hospital. We arrive at Frey Public Hospital and she's lying on the bed. They've wrapped her up in sheets and they've sellotaped both ends. We wait for a bit. No one arrives. Eventually, Eventually we decide, myself and a lady who was also there, she was a porter, or she, in fact, she, she actually used to live at our house. She was boarding at our house. She happens to be there, and myself and her decide that we're actually going to have to wheel this woman to, to the hospital mortuary. And we do it, me and her. We get to the mortuary. It turns out the porter was drunk. We take her body and we put it into the ice. At this stage, I'm still on autopilot. And then it hits me as I'm holding her head. That this isn't right. What am I doing putting my mother in ice? But then, I remember a little girl told herself the world is not a safe place and so in order to survive, I have to be strong. Life continues. About a month and a half ago, I experienced the last of the deaths, thank God. And this time it's my granny who passes away. So my granny passed away now at the end of Feb. And Granny passes on, and no sooner does the news spread, and so everybody knows that Granny has passed on, and it's a huge thing. I was raised by Granny, this is the person who's pivotal to kind of the woman I have become. And so it's huge. On the day of her funeral, it was huge. <laughs> there were maybe like 18 priests, and the whole thing was officiated by the bishop. The church was packed to capacity. It was regal and beautiful and ceremonious, exactly like the woman that Granny was, is. And I remember standing up to, to deliver like a short speech on behalf of the grandchildren. And I will never forget how when I looked up into that crowd that was packed of Abe Fundisi and everybody else, there wasn't a single one of my own friends. My close group of girlfriends had all sent me text messages and calls saying, Hi Chomi, I'm really sorry about Granny. It's so hectic. I hope you'll be fine. I can't make it. And one by one they called me and all had their excuses, valid I'm sure. But on that day, I looked up and there wasn't a single one of my friends in that packed church. I came back and in my anger decided that I was going to leave the, the, the WhatsApp group, our girls' WhatsApp group. I said, but come on, guys. It's 
someone needed to have made a plan. I mean, in the African culture, we say there's something to be said for presence, right? We preach this African culture thing and how we're kind of finding a way back to who we are on social media. But when it comes to the crunch, somehow we struggle to connect the dots. And so I said to them, I'm sorry, my friends, I expected a little bit more from you. And so I can't be part of this WhatsApp group and I left the WhatsApp group. But over the time that I've left the WhatsApp group, I've had time just to think to myself about me and what might have caused something like this. Because at the end of the day, guys, you can do this, right? You do this, but their fingers point back at you. And I suppose in sharing all of these stories of death, it's less kind of about the, the morbidity of death. I don't think death is morbid. I've experienced it enough times to appreciate death for me is so powerful and beautiful. It really is. But the reason I share this is because I find myself at the place where this lifelong learner is going, perhaps, perhaps the time has come to say, let it go, girl. Let go of this need to, 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 to step out into the world thinking that it isn't a safe place. What if, what if you were vulnerable? Because in being vulnerable, maybe I could allow my friends to show up for me in a particular way. As my friends called saying they can't make it, please know that I said to each of them, it's okay, my friend, it's fine, I'll be fine, my friend. It was after the fact that I thought how I wished I had just one of my friends in that packed, crowded hall that had priests and bishops and everybody else. And so I suppose I'm, I'm having to unlearn a couple of things I've learned along the way. I'm having to unlearn that perhaps in being vulnerable, maybe that's where my strength or my greatest strength can also be found. That sometimes it's okay to go, I need you to hold me up this time, right? And so I've reached out to the girlfriends and I said, come over for tea. <laughs> because actually, whilst you guys have some learning to do, I also need to learn to do this vulnerability thing a little bit better. When I stand up to speak, it's grand, it's prepared, it's on point, it's perfect. I'm learning now that it's okay when it's not always perfect. I'm learning that sometimes when it's not perfect, I can rely on those around me to pick me up and to make it perfect. That perhaps perfect isn't just created by me. That perfect is when we can co-create together something. Yeah. 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 And so, yeah, I think I've come to the end of the story. Just, just saying I, I continue to learn. And for me, I probably want to say every day I walk through the door, I'll be a little bit more mindful to say perhaps vulnerability can step in first and then I will follow. Oh. Because the world, yes, can feel unsafe at times. But for me, I've got to learn that perhaps the safety will come from when I can just let go. Just let go. Just bring all of me. Hold nothing back.